we've been having a great time listening about that man. And week over week, that man has turned into this man. And we learned about the specifics of this man. About seven weeks ago, our pastor introduced that man. And thank you for being here. My hands never shook like that before. <laughs> and he introduces about a man who had the power of controlling the wind. That no matter what the winds brought forth you, those winds would obey him. And that that same man had his own winds that would help take control over your life. And then the following week, we learned that that man was also a man of truth. He called himself the truth, the way, the life. And that man, because he declared these things, people became aware of him. And Pastor Fernando took us to the following week where we learned about this man's hands, as Brother Noah reminded us. And this man's hands were so, so marvelous and so gentle that they were able to create us. From the beginning of time. And they were so gentle that they can care for us. In this life. Strong enough to defend us. To protect us. But swift enough. To discipline us. And this man in his hand stood for us. And he drew the line of our accusers and stood along with us and said, let someone else throw the first stone who is also ah, perfect, but no one else but him. And then the following week, we learned about this man and his actions. And this man, as he lived on earth, as he walked around, he wasn't a man that just stood around or wasted of his time, wasn't a man that was just living by chance. And his actions gave us the choice that if we were willing, he was also willing to get us out of our situation. He was willing to meet us, maybe in the place where we have been stuck for many years. And if we were willing, we would no longer live that life. And because of that action, and because of that man, well, his name became famous. He became famous. And the things that he did started going around. And people knew him for the miracles that he was doing, for the healings that were happening, for the liberations. But he became famous because he was not only healing people, but he was also sending them on their way forgiven of their sins. And this man's fame spread around. And everyone began to listen. And those that wanted to and had the ear to listen inclined to him. And those that didn't, well, they put him to a cross. And they hung him. And last week we learned that he did this out of love. A love like no other love, as Pastor Patrick reminded us. A love Something that as humans we so desperately need. We probably spend a lifetime looking for love. But this man's love was like no other love. Because it was a love that you cannot get away from. That nothing could separate you from it. No matter how deep. No matter how high. No matter what you built up against it. Nothing would separate you from the love of that man. And this morning, I will not be appealing to the theologians. It is not my intent. This morning, I want to speak about this man's purpose. This man's purpose. I was going to speak about this man's love. And when I heard it last week, I almost fell right there where I was standing. I said, Lord, that's what I was going to talk about. This man's love. But this man's love is wrapped around this man's purpose. 
And you might ask yourself this morning, well, what is this man? Who is this man? And, and why does he live like this? And why do we hear about his hands? And why is there this man? Why is there a man that we have come to know for the things that he did? Why did he start? And my friend, maybe today you think about the reason we have uh, these decorations and lights as the reason for this season. And I do not want to get into that. But I do want to tell you about the reason we celebrate Jesus Christ. And it all started at the beginning. So if you allow me, I'm going to take you through a journey I will try to summarize as much as I can, so I won't read a lot of the scripture that I have, but I want to let you know about who we are as humans, what the Bible says we are as humans, and it calls us sinners. And since the beginning of time, we have been close to sin. You see, the Bible tells me that at the beginning of time, God created us. You and I, he formed us out of dust. Well, he formed Adam and through there, the, 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 the humanity existed. And as Adam and Eve began to live, so did sin. Because before Adam and Eve were done, there was already Satan, Lucifer, on this earth, along with a third of his angels. And since the beginning, since the beginning humanity has fallen to sin... Um, Man has also been there. A life, uh, we believe that we were created by God along with the heavens and the earth. Humanity was formed at the beginning of time. And since the beginning of time, humanity has fallen into sin. It started with the fruit that would seem to bring forth so much enjoyment, but instead brought forth the introduction to death. And as sin marinated with Adam and Eve, so did guilt and shame and uh, embarrassment and the desire to hide from the presence of God. Sin will destroy all the things that you have with the Lord and will always bring consequences. And theirs was to remove, to be removed from the Garden of Eden. And along with being removed from the Garden of Eden, women would have to now bear pain in the miraculous uh, gift of giving birth. And man would have to toil or till the ground until the ends of our days. And until the dirt, until the dust that we came from, we would return from it. And we know that sin produces nothing but death. Romans 6.23 tells us, for the wages of sin is death. And none of us are free from this. For we all have sinned and have come short to the glory of God. But we have a hope. And in that hope, I will focus today. The gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. I didn't even read my opening scripture. But if you'd like to go to Acts 13, 38, 39. Therefore, let it be known to you, brethren. That through this man is preached to you the forgiveness of your sins. And by him everyone who believes is justified from all the things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. From the beginning of the scriptures we read God's desire to have an intimacy with his people. With his creation. He would make covenants. And provide instructions to allow his people to be under his grace and his purpose and his protection. Through Abraham, the covenant involves a promised land, a great nation, a chosen people, a circumcision of the flesh, and a blessing to all through his seed, through his descendancy. With Moses, part of Abraham's descendants, he also made a commandment or a covenant with him to free his people from the Egyptian bondage. While in bondage, God ordered all the Israelite people to sacrifice the lamb in order to spare their lives. The lamb was to be without blemish, without defect. The blood of the lamb was to protect them from the angel of death. And the Passover sacrifice marked their freedom from the Egyptian bondage. Then God gives Moses the Ten Commandments. The law to govern the people. The law to govern humanity. And he begins... His work in foreshadowing the salvation of humanity. They at those times had to create a dwelling place. A sanctuary. A holy place where only the justified could go in there and enter it. And be around in the midst of the almighty. 
But then, as we read scriptures, the day of atonement would arrive and God would show them finally the power of forgiveness. You see, once a year, they would have to find a lamb, a lamb without defect and sacrifice it and save its blood and cover over the tabernacle and all the vessels inside of it and then find another lamb and confess all their sins upon that lamb and let it out in the wilderness. And they did this year over year and it was the way that it was shown to them by God that they would receive forgiveness for their sins. And they did this for as long as time would tell in the Old Testament. And I'm not sure, friend, why we don't do that today. Well, I know why. <laughs> but I think to myself, and why did God give it to us so easily? These people were called. The Bible says that Moses and, and uh, Aaron, um, they heard audibly the voice of God. And they had this direction. And us, we don't have to worry about buying lamb. Because you know why? We probably have to go buy one that only eats organic grass. We probably have to find one that's been in 10 acres of land without butting into another goat or another lamb or another sheep. I don't know. Maybe because by this time he knew that we were going to stick hormones in everything that we ate. I don't know, maybe because the lamb would be too big that it wouldn't suffice. Or maybe because we would never find a holy place in our home to hold his presence in. But it did change. In Hebrews 9, uh, you can read verses 11 through 30 there. And it shows us that like the people of Israel used to sacrifice the lamb without blemish for the covering of their sin. Jesus Christ came to this earth to end that old covenant and begin a new one. One where not by the blood of goats or bulls we would have our sins covered, but by his blood covered and forgiven. 21 and 22 verses says, Then likewise sprinkled with blood the tabernacle and the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood. And without shedding of the blood, there is no remission. No forgiveness. But verses 27 to 28 say, And it is appointed for men to die once. But after this, the judgment, so Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time. But not for your sins, for salvation. He is our priest. He is our sacrifice. He entered into a heavenly tabernacle. And by his blood, he cleansed us all from sin. We know the story that in this time in Bethlehem, a Jesus was being born. A son was being born. And we know the story because... Well, it's Christmas. Who doesn't know the story about Jesus? If you never heard about it. Uh, it was someone that was born. That he was supposed to be the king of the Jews. And he was born. And that's where the majority of us stop. And we have. Uh, uh, I forget what it's called in English. Major. Manger. We would have a manger. And that's what we would think about it. We have some uh, stars. And we put it out in the heaven. And that's what we think about. But when Jesus was born on this earth. My friend. When Jesus was born on this earth. He lived a life that was already ordained, already predestined, already purposeful. And I'm trying to take you through this journey so we can get to the place where we need to be. And while he was on this earth, he lived the life that God had called him to be. That God had ordained for him. And he lived on earth and he grew up. And we start reading more about him when he's in his age of 30s. And in the age of 30s, he became the teacher, the master. And he started proclaiming about his purpose. And he started talking about the reason why he was born. And he started calling himself the Messiah. And he started telling people that the only way to be saved was through him. And we learn that in the him calling himself the truth, he was 
also calling himself the father. But what we need to focus on is that God came down. He incarnated himself as Jesus and he lived a life that was not a pleasant life, a life that was not an easy life by any means, a life that he experienced wounds for us. A life where he taught about how someone should live, taught about how someone should pray. But all of that didn't matter until he took the ultimate sacrifice. And the reason we have crosses during this time is because he chose to live, um, he go through a sacrifice, through a, a, a crucifixion that was not deemed for him. He was wounded for our iniquities. He was sped upon. He was tortured. He went through this horrible pain just so you and I would have the ability of having our sins forgiven. When he was on that cross... He could have got off of it. He could have got off of it. But he stayed there. He stayed there because the blood needed to be shed. The blood needed to be shed because when they used to kill the goat, they used to drain the blood, cover the tabernacle, and fill the vessels When his blood began to shed, he started covering the heavenly tabernacle and the vessels for our sins. John 3.16 says that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Someone who grew up in church, I've heard it all the time. And I kept thinking about you, friend, during this whole week. I kept thinking about you who, who you know this already. But you've never had it revealed to you. He gave his only begotten son so that you and I would believe in him. Not know about him, not understand the story, not know what comes next, what came before. But so that you and I would believe in him and have everlasting life. Believing in him will liberate you from the guilt that you have. Believing in him will liberate you from the doubt that you experience. Believing in him that he truly died on that cross. But for what? So that you and I would have the forgiveness of our sins on a daily basis. Not to live a whole year full of sin and only accept forgiveness once a year. So this is the man's purpose. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And Peter perhaps gives the clearest instructions in Acts 2.38. It says, Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission or the forgiveness of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But before I repent, I must believe. Because your believing produces faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance or the realization of things hoped for, the evidence or the confidence of the things not seen. John 19.28 says, After this, Jesus, knowing all things were now accomplished, the scriptures might be fulfilled and said, I thirst. Oh, I'm sorry, this was in the wrong place. Faith also comes from hearing the message of salvation, the gospel. Romans 10, 17 says, so then faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. 
Mark 16, 15 says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized, he will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. John 3, 16 through 19, for God so loved the world that he gave his own begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son to condemn the world, but... That the world through him might be saved. Acts 10, 40 to 43. Him, God raised on the third day. Jesus, God raised on the third day and showed him openly. Not to all people, but to witnesses chosen before God. And even to us who ate and drank with him after and arose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people. And to testify that it is he who has ordained by God to judge the living and the dead. To him, all the prophets witness that. His name. Whoever believes in him will receive the forgiveness of sins. Amen. And once I believe, I must repent. Repent. Repent is to have sincere regret or remorse. It is to admit or take ownership of what you are repenting of, repenting for. Repenting will produce change. You see, you can be baptized and not repent it. You can believe and not yet repent. You can believe that it happened. But you're not really ready to give up what's holding you back. Many times we go to churches during this time and we listen to the gospel. We listen to a preacher who's more excited than anything else. And we hear about what he's saying. And we really don't understand what this time is about. But Jesus wants you to be repented. Repented of what? My friend tells me, if you tell me that this water bottle is going to save me, then I'll believe in that water bottle. I just don't want to feel like I'm guilty. <laughs> guilty of what? Repentance is not a shadow of guilt that hovers over you. Repentance is you understanding that God revealing to you that there is more for your life than just living. Repentance is believing that there is a God that loves you, that he saved for you. And when you accept that, you understand that your life deserves so much more than just the weekend celebrations. It deserves so much more than the things that we spend our time in. Repentance is not a guilt. It's a revelation to the things that you have been missing. It's the renewing of your mind that will focus you on the things not of this world. That's why Acts says, repent, therefore, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come to the presence of the Lord. Time of refreshing. You know how you hit control R on your computer and it just refreshes everything that's gone wrong. Things don't look correctly on your computer. Just hit refresh. It'll get better. Times of refreshing when you are in the presence of God and you are repented everything will get refreshed Romans 12 1 and 2 and do not be conformed to this world but be transformed with the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is good and acceptable the perfect will of God Acts 26 20 but I openly proclaim for this to Damascus and to Jerusalem and throughout the region of Judea and even to the Gentiles that they should repent Change their inner self, their old way of thinking, and turn to God. Doing deeds, deeds and living lives which are consistent with repentance. Living re in repentance is putting action into our faith. What does it profit, James 2.14, what does it profit, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can faith alone save him? If a brother or sister is naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you says to them, depart in peace, be warm and filled, but you do not give them the things which are needed for their body, what does it profit? Does also faith by itself, it does nothing without works. Once we have given evidence to our belief and repentance, we must be baptized. Mark 16, 16 says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. Matthew 28, 19, go therefore and make disciples 
upon all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. For within baptism and the calling of the name, we will receive the washings of our sins. And now, why are you waiting, says Acts, arise and be baptized and wash your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. First Peter, he compares us to the first flood, the first ending of the world. Verse 20, who formerly were disobedient when once divine lung suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark being prepared in which a few, that is eight souls, were saved through water. There is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not for the removal of filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. With our forgiveness, our conscience is cleaned. We are now also entering into a born again world and born again a new kingdom of God. I, I can't tell you I have a a testimony where I know what it is to be drunk. I know what it is to experience drugs. I don't have that testimony. So when this message was given to me, uh, the topic, I said, we should get someone there who's been wandering in the streets in the middle of the day. <laughs> Maybe someone who, who's experienced an overdose. Someone who's, uh, whose marriage is falling apart and after coming to God, it all got fixed. I, I don't have that testimony where I was jumped into a gang and I had to flee to get out of it. I don't have that testimony where I was addicted to this and addicted to that. My testimony is one where uh, my parents dragged me to church where I fell asleep under to the benches where we were tired of going to church again. My testimony is, what are you doing Friday? Going to the youth service. What are you doing Tuesday? I'm going to prayer. What are you doing Wednesday? It's midweek service. What are you doing Thursday? My dad's got a meeting at church. That's my testimony. That's my testimony. But, but Jesus showed me. The scripture showed us that we can be here. That could be our testimony. Right. And never understand what Jesus did for us. We could be here Sunday after Sunday. And your life could be miserable. You could be here Sunday after Sunday. And be angry. You could be here. You could have worn your knees out here. Your throat is sore because you just sing all the time at church. You don't know what else to do. But you've never accepted the revelation of Jesus Christ. This whole week I was praying for you, friend. I was praying for you. Saying, Lord, let the things that come out of my mouth. Let it touch the ears of someone who's never known about you. And you know what? God showed me that it wasn't just the souls. It wasn't just the first time comers. If it's your first time here, friend, I want you to know that I love you in Christ. I want you to know that the reason we gather here today is because of that atonement that Jesus broke. And the day that he spent his time on the cross 
was because you deserve so much more. And I know that sounds so weird. And I don't know how to say it out of church terms. But God has plans for you. God has purpose for you. It's not a coincidence that you're here. And I know you can't wait to get home. But it's not a coincidence. He loves you. And it's simple. All we have to do is. It's like a 12 step program. I've never been through it. But I read about it. You have to start with admitting it. We are sinners. The scriptures are clear. We must repent and then be baptized. Repent does not mean that you are a horrible person. Repentance means that you understand that your life has purpose now. And when we baptize... We're baptizing ourselves under the name, the name of Jesus Christ. And I have a lot of more scriptures and I'm going to go through them. But I want you to know what it means to be baptized. And I want you to hear it under what name we are to be baptized. And this will be the beginning, the beginning of your understanding. Go therefore. Oh, I'm sorry. I already read that. In John 3, 5, it says, Jesus answered to them and said, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? How can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom. And today we witness four young men who decided to give their life to the Lord. Lord, they are entering into the kingdom. But he gave him a commandment, go and baptize them in the name, in the name. And I'm here to tell you today, my friend, that Jesus is the name of the son. Isaiah 9, 6 says, for unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Matthew says, and she will bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus for he will save his people from their sins. So all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet who he just read. Behold, the virgin shall be with the child and bear a son and they shall call him Emmanuel which means God is with us. The son is the truth and Jesus said to him, I am the way, I am the truth and I am the life and no one comes to the father except through me. So my friend, I'm here to tell you that the son, the son's name is the father. No one has ever seen God, but the unique one who is himself God, not a God. He is God is near to the Father's heart, he has revealed God to us. So if Jesus is the Father, then the name of the Father is Jesus. And I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. He who is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. The world cannot receive him because it isn't looking for him and does not recognize him. But you know him because he lives with you now And later will be in you. No, I will not abandon you as orphans. I will come to you. Soon the world will no longer see me. But you will see me since I live. You will also live. When I am raised to life, you will know that I am in my Father. And you are in me and I am in you. Jesus declares that the Holy Spirit is a comforter. And Isaiah declares the Son as a counselor. Jesus declares the Holy Spirit of the Spirit of the truth. And Jesus declares himself as the truth. Jesus declares that he will come and not leave us comfortless. And Isaiah declares the Son as the comforter. If the Son is the Holy Spirit, the name of the Holy Spirit is Jesus. The oneness of God teaches us one revealed in three manifestations. Father, creator, the Son, redeemer. And the Holy Spirit abiding in our hearts. And to make it clear, my friends, that we baptize under the name of Jesus Christ. 
The name of the one God is Jesus, revealed in the incarnated word in John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with us, and the word was God. Verse 14, and the word was made flesh, and it dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten Father, full of grace and truth. And that's why Peter says, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. He will dwell in you. I'm going to invite you to stand on your feet. Jesus' life on earth was not an easy life by any means, nor pointless. It was one filled with purpose, a difficult purpose, a purpose of pure sacrifice. However, because of his love for you, he came down as an earth to fulfill the promise of salvation, to teach us about the benefits that we have in him, to spread the gospel of the good news. To forgive your sins. He set the example for you and I, one that starts with belief, then repeatedly, then repentance, and then our life really commences when we are baptized. Because only after we rise from water baptism do we start our new life with Him and He with us. My last scripture, therefore, we're buried with Him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. We are sinners. We must believe. We must repent. We must, must be baptized. And my wife, the way she says it, if we be our be, then we can expect with joy when Jesus will be BRB. So if we believe, repent, and get baptized, then we will have joy when Jesus will be right back. I'm going to invite you to close your eyes. Father, I've said all I have to say. here today as everyone has their eye closed. Know that Jesus loves you. And if I fail to explain it, he left his throne in heaven to have intimacy with you. He came into this earth and for three years he told us about who he is and that a promise that was once only for a people, for a chosen nation was now for everyone. And that only through him we could experience forgiveness of our sins. And forgiveness of our sins would be found only through his name. And all we would have to do is repent and be baptized. And our new life would start. If you're curious about that. If you're wondering of what that looks like. If you just want to know more about Jesus Christ. I invite you to this altar. As everyone remains with their eyes closed. I want to invite you to this altar. And all we're going to do is just pray. All we're going to do is just pray. And I'm going to invite the rest of the church to come on up. And let's just, if we can, worship him for that sacrifice that he did.